minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We call the fancy. Welcome, people. everyone. <laughs> you tell them they're handsome with that on. So. Notice is hereby given of the regular meeting of the Board of Education of the Town of Westfield in the County of Union, New Jersey, at 7.30 p.m. on the evening of Tuesday, May 21st, 2019, in the boardroom of the Administration Building, 302 Elm Street, Westfield, New Jersey. The purpose of the meeting is to transact the regular business of the board and to transact any other business to come properly before the board. This is to advise the general public and to instruct that it be recorded in the minutes that in compliance with Chapter 231 of the Public Laws of 1975, entitled the Open Public Meetings Act, the Westfield School Board on Thursday, May 16, 2019, caused to be posted at the Office of the Board of Education, located at 302 Elm Street, Westfield, New Jersey, and delivered to the Westfield Leader, the Star Ledger, the Westfield Library, Town Clerk of Westfield, Tap into Westfield, and Patch.com, a meeting notice setting forth the time, date, and location of this meeting. Dana, would you like to do a roll call? Michael Beeland. Here. Kent Diamond. Here. Brendan Gallian. Here. Robert Garrison. Brian Marcy. Here. Gretchen Oleg. Tara Porto. Here. Peggy Astor. Here. Amy Root. Here. Thank you. Brian, would you like to lead us in a flag salute? I pledge allegiance to the, to the flag, flag of the United States, States of America and, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Um, tonight we're going to recognize some of our fine arts students, so I'm going to move over to the podium for the next part of the meeting. These are always exciting evenings for recognizing um, our students, and I truly enjoy them. So tonight we honor the Westfield High School students who performed in the state and regional vocal and instrumental ensembles in the 2018-19 school year. They face rigorous audi auditions, often competing against hundreds, sometimes more than a thousand, student music musicians from the region and across the state. The amount of time and effort these students put into perfecting their musical proficiency is amazing, and it is no wonder that they are here today for recognition. We will begin with three talented members of our high school orchestra. When I call your name, please come to the podium to accept a certificate of recognition and remain here until all three, along with the orchestra director, have been recognized. Thank you. Uh, Kevin Lee. You can come over here. Last month in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, senior Kevin Lee joined the first violin section <laughs> of the highly selective All Eastern Orchestra, which features the, stop, the top student musicians from 11 states and the District of Columbia. Kevin also performed with the All State Orchestra last November as principal second violin and with the Region 2 Orchestra in January. Congratulations. Kelly Egan. <laughs> Bass player and sophomore Kelly Egan performed with the All Straight Orchestra last November and with the Region 2 Orchestra in January. She auditioned and was selected to perform again with the All Straight, or All Straight Orchestra next fall. Congratulations. <laughs> Amy Zhao. Amy, a freshman violinist, joined Kelly and Kevin in the Region 2 Orchestra in January. She was selected as well to perform with the Allstate Orchestra in the fall. Of course, there is a fourth person who should be recognized for his hard work and dedication, Orchestra Director Craig Stanton. <laughs> so I'd like to... As much as I'd like to say more about the students, I think you know them, and I'm going to turn the podium over to you to talk about them. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, and thank you for, for uh, giving them an opportunity.
opportunity to be honored tonight. Um, you know, it's hard work, but honestly, it's you guys have given me one of the easiest jobs in the world, and I get to work with these really talented kids, and it makes my life a lot easier knowing that I have kids like this to come to every morning. So they worked incredibly hard. I just put them there. <laughs> they did all the hard work, and they were fantastic. So one more round of applause for them. Thank you. Congratulations. You're welcome to stay or make a quick exit to the left or whatever. <laughs> whatever works. Just waiting for the chorus to come in. It's a slightly larger group. So. <laughs> they should sing something. Hmm? They should sing something. No. <laughs> You're the one with radio voice. Come on, Ken. Yeah. <laughs> oh, very good. <laughs> Marianne. Um, it's a great looking, large, very organized group. So, um, so we just recognized the members of uh, the orchestra, and now we would like to take this opportunity to recognize the members of the chorus. Um, members of our high school chorus continue to impress us with their musical skill. Many have auditioned and been accepted into all state choruses next fall. Tonight, we recognize outstanding performances of the 2018 19 school year. Um, beginning with, but I'm going to ask you when I call your name if you come up. I'm going to give you a certificate, and if you kind of line up in the front of the room so we kind of have everybody up here. Uh, senior Matthew Cerati, whose hard work. <laughs> Matthew's hard work and dedication and talented musicianship earned him a spot with the All Eastern Chorus, which performed last month. Matt also joined the All State Mixed Chorus last November and the Region 2 Chorus in January after scoring first in the tenor one section during aud auditions and tying for the highest score overall. <coughs> Congratulations. Next, I invite Zachary Lemberg to the podium. <clears throat> Zachary also performed with the All-State Mixed Chorus. Performing with both the All-State Mixed Chorus last fall and the Region 2 Chorus in January were senior Joseph Maldonado, Thank you. 
Joseph scored first in the tenor two section for the region two. Congratulations. Uh, okay. Charlotte Geary. She's not here. And Junior Vincent Mora. He's not either. Both of them, as it says here, and guess what they want? Are, are not able to join us, but we congratulate them and we'll send their certificates home with the director. Okay. Performing with the All State Treble Chorus in February were Sam Horvath. Sam also joined the Region 2 Chorus. Um, and also as a member of the All-State Treble Chorus was Allison Brown. Um, I'm going to call out the names. These, were these are additional members of the Region 2 Chorus. Junior Daniel and Andrade. <laughs> And I apologize if I say it wrong. <laughs> Sophomore Russell Cohen. <laughs> Freshman Anna D'Angelo. Junior Rosalind Garabet. <laughs> Sophomore Zariah Katz. <laughs> Freshman Joshua Madeira. I'd also like to point out Joshua scored second in the tenor two section. Uh, also, sophomore Matthew Meixner. <laughs> sophomore Aishik Palit. Junior Rachel Seiden. <laughs> Rachel also scored fourth in the Alto 2 section. As always, we'd like to recognize the talented instructors, instructors who spend tireless hours with their students. We invite our choral directors, John Brzezowski and Maureen Francis, to come to the podium to receive a certificate. So also, I'm sorry if I missed your name, I'd like to call Kayla Lewison, who is a member of the Region 2 Chorus. So I'm going to turn the mic over to the, inst the instructors. That doesn't sound like the right word, the directors. <laughs> so it's so, so awesome to see all these students up here. I think I, I was looking at the names on paper before, but now to see them in front of me, I'm like, wow, I'm just so proud of you guys for your accomplishments this year. And just so that you're aware, these kids have to uh, go through a very rigorous audition process. They have to meet with us. They have to go with their private lesson teachers. They spend time on their own learning this material. They spend time to go to auditions. Um, and then uh, some of them even uh, don't make it the first or second or third time. And they continue. And, and it shows resilience and character that they're able um, to, to keep with it. So um, just on behalf of Ms. Francis and I, I'd like to say that uh, you, know, you guys make Westfield High School Choir proud and, and the Westfield community proud. So thank you.
Do you want a picture? A picture? Yeah, two rows. You feel famous. You can sing with me. Thank you. Thank you. As you guys leave, I'm going to second Kent the next time when you all come back again. I would like a little Song. music for our uh, <laughs> entertainment. <laughs> No, the guy, um, the cancer was one. Oh, there, I couldn't place how I knew. They have a younger son named Isaiah, right? He plays basketball. They might. I know him through, He's like uh, through our church. Oh, Car yes, he yeah. does. What's yeah. his name? Isaiah. No, Jim, oh. Mike, what's his name? The, the Carl Lewis. Carl, thank you. Thank you. His mom is Ohio, and I was like, wait, I didn't know the name back. Well, she um, was the lead in the play last year. She had a great voice. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Last week, and wow, what's my stick figures look like? You know, maybe it's not. I came around my office to come down, and there was a family checking out. I saw you, right? And they had two daughters, and both of them are in this building. And then the little one, the five year old, sees herself in a picture from Lincoln. It's me. I like that we have the artwork here. Yeah, I do too. My daughter's was here last year. And she was lucky enough, she had her piece last week in the uh, high school. Oh, nice. yeah. oh, nice. She didn't get that talent from me. Is this a book? Can you <laughs> so not only do we have amazing musicians at the high school, we also have amazing musicians at the intermediate school that we'd like to honor tonight. Um, all of these musicians, or some of them, have excelled in state and regional ensembles. I can only imagine the many hours of practice you have put in to achieve at this level. We are proud, very, very proud of your accomplishments. When I call your name, please come to the podium and receive a certificate of recognition. And if you would remain up here, I know it's a slightly large group, so you have to kind of work around the space that we have here so that we can get photos at the end and at the end after we recognize everybody. First, I'd like to invite up viola player Kevin Chen.
Kevin performed with the Allstate Orchestra this past weekend, so congratulations on that. He also performed with the Region 2 Orchestra earlier this year. Next, I'd like to invite up Stephen Wang. He's not, not here right. this evening. Okay, we'll <laughs> Stephen plays the violin and also performed with both the Allstate and Regional 2 Orchestras. Um, we're going to go through the following students from Edison and Roosevelt, all performed with the Region 2 Ensemble this year. They are from Edison, the Region 2 Band, Eric Bucklers, Grade 8, Bass Clarinet. <laughs> William Crawl, Grade 8, Tuba. Charles Hu, grade seven, oboe. <laughs> Yusuf Lee, grade eight, trumpet. <laughs> and lastly, Nolan Daly, he can't be here this evening. And he's a seventh grader who also plays the trumpet. So congratulations, Nolan. <laughs> From Edison for the Region 2 Orchestra, Claire Chin, grade six, violin. <laughs> and Felix Yu, grade eight, violin. From Roosevelt for the Region 2 Orchestra, Julian Hamilton, Grade 8, Viola. <laughs> Tristan Rowe, Grade 8, Cello. <laughs> also from Roosevelt for the Region 2 Wind Ensemble, Liam Morello, Grade eight, percussion. And as with all of our groups, our directors, instructors, teachers, many hats that you wear, um, we'd also like to recognize you for all the work that you do with the students. Um, Amanda Grant, Edison Orchestra. John Scrozero. How'd I do? <laughs> Bryce Freeman. And James Doyle. He's not here. <laughs> there you go. Well, I'd like to turn the mic over to the directors, and if you have something you'd like to say about your students, I know some of you represent Edison, some you represent Roosevelt. Good. I would just like to um, extend my appreciation for all of these wonderful students, but um, personally to Julian and Tristan, who could not be here. Uh, one of the Many joys of my job is that I get the students all three years, and even then, I usually meet them beforehand with uh, elementary concerts, or in Tristan and Julian's case, if I uh, taught their older siblings. So it has been quite an amazing experience watching Julian grow into such an amazing young man and musician. Um, to be as gifted as he is, this is your third year in a row making reasons, to be as gifted as he is and to remain as humble and level-headed at the middle school age. <laughs> that, uh, that really says a lot. And this is always the bittersweet time of the year because uh, this is, you know, we have one more concert, we're gonna perform at graduation, and that's it. But I just wanted to 
uh, just say what a pleasure it's been uh, to teach you for these three years. Thank you, Julian. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yes, congratulations to all the students here, and particularly, a little biased here, but uh, all the Edison Band students. Uh, like uh, Mr. Freeman said, it's, a, it's really awesome getting to teach uh, the same students for three years. Um, and so, yeah, it's a privilege to have them. And I would love to say that, you know, we are the ones that do this and we shape them and we mold them. I but <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, we, we give them the music uh, usually in September. We said the auditions in January. And then I say, okay, work on your own. And then I see them in about December and they've done, you know, 95% of the hard work. And, you know, I'll say, okay, tweak this, tweak this. But, you know, uh, it's really a testament to. Um, everything that they do at home uh, to the parental support that they have, whether it's you know getting them private lessons or listening to all of the mistakes in the practice time so they can shine uh, in the actual performance area. But yeah, it really is uh, the students' work that do this. Uh, uh, so kudos to you guys. Uh, you put in a lot of hard work and you deserve everything that you get. Um, just to again echo what Mr. Freeman and Mr. Scazzaro said, it is this is really difficult kind of cutthroat um, auditions that they had to go into and with very challenging music. So for all of you, uh, this is really truly an honor to see you grow musically and to see you here tonight. And um, I just want to also recognize Kevin there at the very end. This is actually his. He's been in all uh, region and all state all three years of his middle school career, which is a really difficult <laughs> thing to do and definitely worthy of this recognition. And so, um, also my youngest student here, Claire, who's only in sixth grade now. Now she has a lot to look forward to. So um, it's really been awesome to see how far that they've come and see the accomplish accomplishments that they've made. And thank you so much for your support. We couldn't. We couldn't do this without you. So thank you so much. Can I ask you to give him the two rows because it might be a little hard for me to get everybody? Yes. All students in the back. <laughs> Charlie, you step forward. Mm -hmm. Karen, can you come out and pictures of it all? I'm on the short side. I'm on the short side. I'm on the short side. I'll go on this side. Yeah, Everybody look here. Right? <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. It's truly special to have a love of music, and I'm sure all those kids just, you know, love music in the form that they choose to present it in, and um, you know, to honor them is is uh, is an honor for me. So, and it's especially exciting to know this whole group that was standing behind me just now has many more years to come forward for uh, more awards and recognition. So we look forward to that in the coming years. Um, I'd like to move on to announcements. Yes, I have one. Okay. 206 juniors and 12 seniors from Westfield High School were inducted into the National Honor Society on May 9th in recognition of academic excellence, leadership, service, and character. A video of the National Honor Society induction ceremony is posted on the Blue Devil television section of the Westfield High School homepage. Congratulations to all, and a special thanks to National Honor Society advisor Scott Rutherford. Thank you. Michael. 
Yes, uh, Westfield High School senior Austin Chen has been named the 2019 National Merit Scholarship winner. Austin was among 2,500 students from a pool of approximately 15,000 finalists across the United States to receive a National Achievement Scholarship of $2,500. Congratulations to Austin on this prestigious accomplishment. Thanks, Michael. Thank I you. Know. Yes. I apologize in advance for mispronouncing the name. Congratulations to Sherzad Mustafa, winner of the Westfield Historic Preservation Commission's Student Art and Writing Contest. Sherzad is a ninth grade student at Westfield High School. He will receive the award for his poem, Walk Down Boulevard, at the HPC's Devlin Awards Ceremony on Thursday, June 6th at 7.30 p.m. in the community room of Town Hall. Thank you. Ryan? Westfield High School senior Jamie Didea was named Union County Municipal Alliance Volunteer of the Year at the Local Advisory Committee on Alcoholism and Drug Abuse Annual Va Volunteer Recognition Dinner in Union on May 7th. Didea is president of the Westfield High School Dream Team, which promotes positive decision making and healthy choices through programs that provide alternatives to underage drinking and drug use. The Lakata Volunteer of the Year is recognized for exemplary service to the New Jersey Alliance to Prevent Alcoholism and Drug Abuse Program, the largest network of community-based anti-drug coalitions in the nation. Thank you. Ken. I have two. There is lots of good news from the Westfield High School Theater Department. The fall production of Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are Dead received the Montclair State University Foxy Award for Outstanding Achievement by an Acting Ensemble of a Comedy. The spring production of Sweet Charity has received seven Paper Mill Playhouse Rising Star Award nominations and honorable mentions. The winners will be announced at a ceremony at the Paper Mill on Tuesday, June 4th. And at the Bucks County Student Theater Festival in April, the one-act Top Girls was recognized as the outstanding student-directed production. The cast of Top Girls included Talia McRoberts, Julia Savado, and Remy Schindel. Julia Savato was also recognized for outstanding performance by an actress in the feature role for her performance. Congratulations to all the nomination, nominees and winners and to Westfield High School Theater Director Daniel Devlin. The second announcement. The deadline for Westfield residents interested in considering a term on the Board of Education is Monday, July 29th at 4 p.m. when nominating petitions are due at the County Clerk's Office in Elizabeth. The Westfield Board of Education will have five open seats in November. The three board members who three year, whose three-year terms are expiring are Michael Bielan, Brendan Galligan, and Amy Root. Additionally, there will be a two-year term and a one-year term, which represent the remainder of the unexpired terms of Charles Ofstrop and Len Berner, who resigned in January 2019. Robert Garrison and Brian Morrissey were board appointed in February to fill those seats through December. They will be required to run again if interested. More information on the board election process can be found under the board section of the district website. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Amy? <coughs> okay. Oh, did you have another? <coughs> well, Rob did. Okay. 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 Go ahead, Tara. Okay. Congratulations to the following Westfield High School students who achieved the top score of 36 on portions of the April 2019 ACT standardized tests. Grade 11, Catherine Bartlett for reading, Eric Elizas for math, science, and STEM. Madeline Katz for English and Reading, Spencer Rothfleisch for English, Justin Salina for Reading, and Elijah So for English. In grade 10, Kyle Azaretto for Reading. Okay, okay. congratulations. Amy? Yep, uh, I have two. Um, Edison Intermediate 7th graders Sophia Gill and Hannah Halosi have been named finalists in the 2019 Project CS Girls competition for middle school girls. Project CS Girls is a nonprofit organization that believes that nurturing an interest in science, math, and technology during the critical middle school period will help them to better see themselves as the future leaders of tomorrow. The girls will attend a national gala in the Washington, D.C. area in early June, which will feature guest speakers, hands-on workshops, technology talks, and a formal awards ceremony at which the winners will be announced. That's pretty cool. And... Westfield Public Schools and offices will be closed on Friday, May 24th, for the unused snow day, and on Monday, May 27th, to observe Memorial Day. Please remember that the town's parade, in which many of our students will participate, begins at 9 a.m. This year's Grand Marshal title has been awarded posthumously to Dr. Derek Nelson. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. 
too dull, Jenna. I do not. Um, I will f uh, finish it with our next meeting of the Westfield Board of Education. It will be held on Tuesday, June 11th at 7 p.m. at 302 Elm Street. It will be a reorganization meeting of the board. Please note the change of the starting time from 7.30 till 7 p.m. as we also honor the intermediate and high school teachers and staff of the year. A complete agenda of the meeting will be available on Friday, June 7th on the board section of the dis district website. At this time, I'd like to recognize the public for agenda items only. Agenda items only. Seeing number, nobody come forth to the podium, we'll move on to the superintendent's report. Dr. Dole. Thank you. And actually, tonight we have two reports. Um, the first report uh, focuses on um, a new elementary report card, which will be introduced next year. But we've been trying to make sure we are communicating the information regarding that starting this year. And then we will again uh, share the information with interested parents and uh, especially uh, being in next year. So to start the presentation, I believe I am turning this over to our Assistant Superintendent for Curriculum, Mr. Paul Panero. Yeah, no, yeah. Everybody else, they got a little applause. <laughs> I don't see a certificate up here. No, sorry. It's in the mail. Well, in the mail. <laughs> maybe when it's all finished. Um, so the elementary report card uh, is a big project. And a couple of years back when we started talking about revising the report card, like many people, I thought it meant looking at the current language and making sure it was aligned with the standards that had been revised in the most recent round of uh, state revisions. But it's much bigger than that. Um, so uh, it was a two-year process. It included everyone you could imagine. Uh, many teachers were involved. We had a subcommittee of the elementary administrators, um, many, many meetings, and uh, a lot of teacher input on what ultimately would be the supplemental materials that go with the card. But there's a lot more to it. So uh, we've put together a PowerPoint that will include a, a video. So is this my first time with the new TV? Okay, so those are some of the reasons why um, we had to adjust the report card. We had some new standards that had come along and also instructional frameworks had changed the way we teach ELA at the elementary level. There were new science standards and that became more aligned with engineering design process. So um, there, was, there was a pretty significant change in the way the report card would read relative to the standards. So, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm, just because that thing is in the way. Uh, right, so the whole idea about the, the report card is that um, initially or traditionally, uh, I'm gonna do it out the slide. So uh, traditionally the report card is sort of based on accumulating a number of assignments and then quantifying them in some way, coming up with some average and then plugging it in when the report card comes around. And um, you know that, that's, that's always been something educators talk about uh, as far as like can you precisely get the nature of where a student is at, especially in the elementary school with the particular skills that um, are involved in, in the curriculum and, and uh, progressing in those skill areas. So um, one thing I think that can give you a good overview is about a four or five minute video that we put together and uh, it gives you the broad overview and then we can drill down to some of the details a little bit more with a few slides after that. The Westfield Public School District has completed a two-year process of revising the elementary K-5 report card. But why this new standards-based framework? The state standards have changed, and so have some of our instructional frameworks. This change allows for more targeted objectives, including clearer goals for learning, more effective instruction, more detailed information, and a growth mindset to help foster in students the belief that ability and competence come from effort not a fixed level of intelligence. So what's different about the standards-based report card? Performance descriptors replace letter grades. Specific skills are evaluated within each subject. There will be trimesters in grades one through five instead of four marking periods. And parents, students, and teachers will be better informed about areas needing additional attention. Our teachers do a great job of monitoring student growth, but the old report card doesn't provide the level of detail that will help parents understand where their students are doing well and where there might be room for improvement. 
One of the biggest benefits of the standards-based report card is, say on the old report card, you would say, oh, my child got a B in math, and the teacher would probably be able to give you some feedback about what your child needed to work on and what the teacher and the child were working on in class to help improve their performance. But now the report card as it's laid out, there are 12 different criteria in say fifth grade where the teacher can point to two of them and say, well, your child is meeting the benchmark in 10 of these areas, which is terrific. But in this area of fractions, they're just progressing toward it. And in this area of algebraic thinking, they have an area that they need to work on as well. And it's my goal as the teacher to work with your child, we're gonna to work together to improve those two areas over the next trimester. So it allows us to set goals, and when we set goals and work towards them, we're much more likely to achieve all of our objectives, which just improves learning and helps kids be more prepared for the next year. I am excited. I think it'll be a good way for us to transition into more centered learning for the students, where they're able to really understand what is it that day that they're being assessed on. In the old way of letter grades, you know, we're just literally taking a, a numeric average or looking at a score. Looking at the standards and the progression really um, shows us the growth in a very specific way. Instead of A, B, C, and D, we've created a system with an E for exceeds meeting that benchmark, or the A for achieves that they're meeting that benchmark, a P for progressing towards that benchmark, and N for it needs support in getting to that benchmark. And those are called performance descriptors. So we can explain what it really means if your child needs support for a certain benchmark. We've created a performance descriptor explanation that further explains, well, they're not yet grasping or applying the key concepts. Or if they're getting an A for achieves, what we're telling you is, yeah, well, you know what? They're consistently grasping and applying these key concepts and skills. And that's the sort of information that we think parents will find more useful, as will the children. At first glance, you might think, oh, that's the same thing as A, B, C, or D. The difference is, as part of transitioning to a standards-based report card, the district spent two years developing rubrics that describe exactly what E, A, P, and N mean for each skill in each trimester. What standards-based grading changes is if a student receives an E, A, P, or N in, for instance, in the subcategories within language arts. The district has a rubric which says exactly what it means to have achieved standard in can analyze a character's motivation in a story. Teachers will have that rubric and that is what will guide their instruction throughout the year. It's what the teachers will look at when they look at a student's trimester's worth of work and where they are by the end of the trimester. It'll also be a resource for parents because whereas parents could look at an old style grade and say, oh, 85%, we like that number, but what does it mean? Now a parent can look at a specific skill and a A for achieving standard. Well, what does achieving standard mean for can analyze a text? Well, they can go to the rubric and look at it as well. So it really bridges the, the gap of the unknown between what the teachers are assessing with students and what parents are understanding with how their students are doing. We are moving to trimesters to allow teachers more time to teach and allow students more time to uh, grapple with difficult concepts that they are introduced to. With trimesters, there's approximately 60 days per reporting term, which is approximately 15 more days than you would have currently with the uh, marking periods. During those 15 days, the teachers will have more opportunities to help students dig deeper, which then, of course, goes into having the students having more learning time, which is in the best interest of the students. With trimesters, the reporting periods would be in December, March, and June, which fall naturally during the breaks of the school year. In kindergarten, we will remain as two semesters, so the reporting terms would be the end of February and the end of June. Lastly, as research supports, standards-based report cards foster a growth mindset in both teachers and students. Why is this important? When students see themselves labeled as an A, B, or C student, they may settle into that expectation as fixed and not see that they have the ability to grow. This can even work against students considered A students because in middle school and beyond, the label doesn't get the work done, focusing on areas of growth does. Growth mindset helps them to understand that they are learners moving along a continuum in a variety of skill sets progressing towards mastery. And that's what standards-based learning is all about.
don't want to go further without first, and I'll, we'll continue with the slides in a minute, but a quick thanks to Marianne McGann, who does such great work with the video. It's difficult for people like myself who have to convey messages quite a bit <laughs> to be able to take the time and thoughtfully put it down and then, you know, hire these great, uh, we'll bring them up soon, great uh, educator actors out there to per <laughs> perform in the video. Uh, it, it's great when you have that kind of support and you can uh, control the message that, that way. Um, I also should... Um, point out that we didn't invent standards-based grading. In fact, there's so much important research to it, and it's been around for quite a long time. And we have a lot of peer districts that we were in contact with over a couple years um, to the point where we were able to learn from any challenges that they may have missed going into it. And we learned from some of their victories and some of their bumps in the road. And uh, frankly, I think we've come out of it um, with the best one, of course, but it, <laughs> the main reason is in the next few slides, and that's that um, we really listened to our teachers when they said, okay, we know what the outcome is, we're all on the same page with what that's supposed to look like, um, but we really need to know what that evidence is going to look like and what it's gonna look like in the first trimester and the second trimester. So that's where uh, some of the details as we deconstruct what goes into the report card, that's what that's all going to be about. So. Um, Okay, so uh, what we have is, when you see the report card, there'll be a key, and the key will uh, include the letters, we work from E when we speak about it pretty much, but uh, EAPN, exceed standards, achieve standards, progresses towards standards, and needs support. That was referenced in the video uh, really well, but just to reinforce that those are the descriptors of where a student is at. And we, we're really trying to get the mindset out there so that parents and students, for that matter, don't really equate you know, those as just four more letter grades or four different letters. That's not the case at all. What's really important is the shift from this idea um, that things are sort of cumulative and they add up to something and you get this number at the top of reading or writing. Um, what this does, again, as it said in the video, was really break it down so that you know in one particular area, uh, you know, say like in three of, a, uh, of seven areas, uh, you might be achieving the standard and in one you're exceeding and then maybe in a couple you are uh, progressing toward. So that really enables students to have a good sense of where they're at and the parent as well and the teacher. Gives them something to communicate about and it also gives targets and goals for kids. And again, that was said in the video, but we can't stress it enough that goal setting for young kids, there's tons of research that says if you wanna develop resilience and perseverance, you do it by setting goals and then in a very positive fashion looking at what it is that you need to do to achieve those goals. And, and that's, that's baked into this whole process. So um, it, the report card is now going to have the trimesters. Uh, so it's December, March, and June for the students. And then uh, I'm not sure exactly how great you can see it, but uh, I, I think we'll certainly be able to see it at home on the screen. But um, there's no longer a writing uh, section with one letter grade A, B, C. What there is is that breakdown that we were just talking about. So uh, we have the trimesters, and uh, as we had stated in the in the video, um, that gives the teachers enough time to collect some evidence and uh, really get a sense of where the students are at. It, it takes more than a summative test, you know, something at the end uh, of a unit or something, and just say, okay, this is their command of reading. No, there are different aspects of it, and it's especially, I, I think, evident to. Uh, people when you think about math. So, you know, you can be really great at computation, um, but be careless. And so that gets lost in the mix. But in, in something like this, you might be more likely to find that out. Oh, and by the way, the kindergarten will not be trimesters. They will continue to be two semesters. So the shift for K1 and 2 isn't as dramatic as it might seem for 3, 4, 5, because they haven't dealt in the world of A, B, C, D. Um, so it's a little more akin to what they're used to. Okay, so these are a lot of arrows, but um, this, is the, this is sort of the, uh, the meat and potatoes of how teachers are going to be able to uh, really pinpoint where students are at. And one of the parents, we've been doing sort of like a tour with this whole thing, um, uh, let's say teachers and uh, administrators have been doing this with um, different groups of PTOs in the spring, and of course we'll continue to do it in the fall. We have resources posted online. Um, but uh, when you really drill it down, this is where the parents and the teachers uh, can, can have those conversations about where students can grow. So um, over the course of really a few months, some of the administrators uh, were working with teachers and supervisors, uh, 
to a great extent who are standards experts in recognizing where the benchmarks are, um, how the benchmarks are um, evidenced throughout each trimester. So you can see that uh, like that aqua blue kind of area, those are the benchmarks. Those match what's on the report card. So what you can tell from that is on the report card, you'll have that statement, the benchmark statement. But then on the rubric, those boxes that you see there, those are the pieces of evidence that the teacher will collect. So you don't want to see all that on the report card. It would be 10 pages long. Um, but what you can do is those rubrics would be online. So if, if one of them popped, and we don't expect parents necessarily to go online and study these rubrics. I mean, that's, that's not the point of it. But it's there. It's information. So if, you, if there are areas you are, you are interested in, you will be able to follow a link and, and get to the whole folder that has the uh, rubrics in them. So as you can see, we're moving from left to right, the, um, the indicators, uh, they, they, we add to the indicators each semester. So there might be three or four in the first trim trimester, not semester. There might be a few in the first trimester. And then in the second trimester, you'll see there's a couple added to it, but they carry over. So those blank spaces are intentionally uh, saying to us that that's coming in the next trimester or the next one after that. So, so much thought went into this. I mean, to the point where I had to referee arguments about language at times, um, <laughs> spelling versus decoding, you know, so that got serious. Um, so that's a, uh, an overview of what the rubric looks like, and, and I think it's a powerful tool. That's the piece that the districts who I'm, you know, I reached out to to get a sense of, they didn't do that necessarily to start, because you really have to anticipate quite a bit mm -hmm. to realize, well, how are they going to collect evidence, and, and how are they going to know what this looks like in a classroom? Um, teachers can look at a statement on a report card and extrapolate that, but our teachers don't work that way and they put us to work and said, you need to really help us narrow down what this is going to look like. And luckily we have the staff that is really expert in doing that. And I'm referring to like the content area supervisors as well as the administrators. So I did share this with one particular district who really gave us so many great tips and everything. And she shared with me that in their case, they're going back to this. So they rolled out theirs, and they did a fantastic job. We learned a lot from them. But then their teachers started collecting evidence in little silos all by themselves uh, to, to figure out what would go into the grading. And now they're starting to have professional development days and um, sessions so that they could all come together and develop that. So they, had, they did it backwards. And it took about two years for them to collect a bunch of separate individual stuff for them to come together and now compile it. But um, I'm really happy we did this because that's like going back to the drawing board to an extent. I know we'll probably have to go back after a year. We'll evaluate you know, each portion of the year and see where we're at. And we'll have to go back and probably tweak a thing or two. But this is a significant piece to have anticipated. So I'm very thankful to the administrators and teachers who really pressed the pedal on this. Um, it's, it's really great stuff. OK, so that's me having fun with arrows. But uh, <laughs> so what that demonstrates, though, is uh, where the benchmark lands on the report card. And so if you ever want to take a really close look at this, it is on the website under curriculum. The last slide shows you where it is. Um, uh, yeah. So if there's something on the report card that you're interested in knowing more about with regard to um, the designation of EAPN that your child might have gotten, you can then, if you chose, pull up the rubric in a, you know, in a shared drive, and you would see what the evidence was like. And in that case, I sort of circled one of them, uh, one of the indicators um, that would demonstrate what the student might be able to work on, and you know, to to be able to move up in that continuum uh, towards exceeding um, exceeding the standards. So. That's really the whole thing in a nutshell. If I could only have one slide, that would be it because it shows all the pieces. Okay, so um, that's where it is on the website. And we're definitely gonna have some questions I wanna bring up. Um, we have uh, Kathy Chow here from Tamaqua School who's a teacher and give her perspective. And uh, Dr. Paul Duncan, who was one of the administrators on the subcommittee that put, you know, to put a lot of time into those rubrics. Um, that's where you can find these resources on our web page, uh, so it has the video and this this PowerPoint. Um, so when we've been doing this uh, presentation, we've done it. Uh, Paul and I have done it. This is our third time. Kathy and I have been involved with it at least a couple times. 
So we've gotten some great questions from parents that have really made us think. Um, one of the ones that popped up real quick, because you get in the weeds a little bit, was that, you know, well, what are the uh, sixth grade teachers thinking? And it's like, that's true, because they're gonna have to help students transition from not having grades into an environment where they do get grades. So that was important. We started talking about that with Dr. Bolton, with Mrs. Fendis, and, and they're um, very excited about this idea of bringing this mindset of growth forward, um, not changing the report card necessarily, but that mindset is what's important in the end, not the report card. Um, so we had all kinds of great questions that led us to really think about how um, this change can benefit students even further and enhance communication. So um, if you, is, uh, could I bring, yeah. So if we could bring up Kathy and Paul, uh, Paul will help me with any questions you might have because he's been uh, in front of a lot of questions. But if it's okay, it's all about the teaching. And so if, if Kathy, if you might just speak for a couple minutes sure. on that. Hi, um, Kathy Chow, I teach third grade at Tamaquis. Um, thank you for having me. Um, so from a teacher's perspective, I'm excited about this change to standards-based grading and report cards. Um, I really feel like um, the administrators have really prepared the teachers um, to make this shift. During our in-service, we've had times to take a look at the report cards. We've been given the opportunity to provide feedback um, and then also just meet with our colleagues. Um, in our building, Mr. Dulks has really done a great job of allowing us to have those conversations with our colleagues, with our peers about, you know, what are our expectations for students when um, they're trying to meet a standard, um, trying to come up with consistent assignments and having those conversations about our students and their learning and how we can improve our instruction to best meet their needs. Um, and ultimately, I really feel like this will be a great change for the students um, and parents one for the students because again the shift in mindset it really gets them to become more reflective learners so instead of seeing that a b c um, letter on their grade i feel like they can look at their report card and say okay i got you know p's in these areas and i got a's in these areas let me take a look and talk with my teacher what can i do to improve in this specific standard you know i'm not reading fluently that well but let me work with my teacher and you know, see where, what I can do to improve in that area and be okay with not getting, you know, that A all the time. And for the students who are our typical A learners, they now have that opportunity to um, exceed, you know, they can then exceed those expectations in those different areas. So I feel like those kids who maybe get hundreds all, all the time now have that chance to say, okay, um, you know, I still have room to grow. And again, I think that'll be a great shift for our um, fifth graders who are going to become sixth graders. So they know, although their report card's going to look a little different, um, their mindset of, um, I need to work harder to you know, accomplish my goals, I think they'll have that as we build that in the elementary grades. Um, and lastly, for the parents, I think it builds a little bit more of a transparency. You get to see like, you know, what learning is really taking place when you're you know, talking about analyzing text, what is that? Now we can look at the rubric and kind of see, um, okay, they're talking about character traits or they're um, you know, trying to figure out what is the lesson learned in this story. And then you, know, you get to see um, how we're exactly assessing the students in those areas. So um, yeah, I'm excited about this and um, I hope you will be too. <laughs> I, I didn't want to, um, I, I said we were going to go to questions, but you know, Paul, you, uh, you were involved in this quite a bit and you talked with a lot of different parents. Are there any questions if you want to come up, anything you'd like to talk about, but like questions that might have jumped out of you, out at you from parents or part of the rubric development process, anything you'd like to share? Sure. Um, when I talk to parents, it's easy to get sort of really focused on some of the detail because there's sort of a lot to look at. And I said, basically when you look at the report card, it's more detailed than it used to be and it helps identify strengths and weaknesses. And by bringing those to the forefront of the conversation, it really helps teachers focus on the individual needs of kids, which then helps them provide more personalized instruction in the classroom, which just improves learning. So really, at the heart of that is what we're trying to do. And we think by having a very detailed report card, but sort of not too detailed, like we really were careful about what we put in it, and then providing teachers with these very helpful rubrics to help guide them that it was really setting it up for success next year. So in a nutshell, that's what we're trying to do. 
but we also want to give you all the, you know, like the background on it as well. But that seems to be the gist of what people are asking about. I noticed something called an effort key, mm -hmm. and I was just wondering about that and where that goes oh. on the report card, right. and how that works. Okay, so um, we have always had, is that's the learning behaviors, I think, that we're referring to? Okay. Yeah. 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 Is it the effort key? Mm -hmm. um, on the why switch to trimester slide. <laughs> oh, it talks about work yeah. habits. Yes. It's really about work habits. Right. Yeah, next to the so right. Traditionally, there were something that we were we called learning behaviors, and what's mm. cool. I'm so glad you brought that up because uh, one of the uh, other aspects of the report card that isn't involved with the uh, the standards uh, for like say instructional learning, but more what goes into um, the behaviors for learning. Uh, traditionally, they would say works hard, um, cooperates, engages, that kind of thing. So that same aspect is still in this report card. But what's kind of cool about this is as part of our um, social emotional learning uh, initiative and goal, we've, um, well, I, we locked, I locked some of the principals in a room and gave them the competencies for SEL and they had a lot of fun with it. And they, they spent a couple of uh, meetings narrowing down um, what, we, you, what we used to have, what things that the competencies from social emotional learning um, suggested and so a lot of thought went into those as well. So they came up with this um, new listing, and so that effort key at the top will tell you if they're doing it consistently um, and, and the other. So there's three degrees of to what extent it's, they're being done. So those are learning behaviors that foster cognitive development. So where does, it, where does that get reported on the report card? Yeah, I, 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 you're right. I don't know that it showed up, but it's in the bottom right. It's on the bottom right, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, when looking at the rubric, uh, first trimester has you know maybe one or two standards, second one has three, five, whatever, mm -hmm. and then the, the third might have seven. Mm -hmm. How does those are check boxes, correct? Oh, oh, okay. So, so how, how does it translate into what gets reported? Do you want to? Sure. So that's on the rubric. <coughs> you need to go over there. Oh, sorry. The sorry. Yeah. yeah, but if, if the tool, if the rubric's the tool to help parents understand. Yes. I'm just trying to figure out the correlation between. The rubric and then what's reported on there. Okay, so the indicators on the report card stay the same, mm -hmm. and then the rubric for each trimester is correlated to that same indicator because those indicators are technically the standards for um, third grade. So as the year progresses, let's say analyzing text in the beginning of the year, um, we're not we're kind of just delving into analyzing, so we're just looking for them to be able to do a couple of the analysis. Okay. Um, pointers and then as we keep going then we're building upon that now we're you know uh, expecting them to make deeper inferences and there's uh, more of that complex mm -hmm. skill that can that's like related to that and then the last one I think that's the most complex so then that's why there's so many more indicators because we're looking at many more aspects of analysis that is connected to that one indicator by the last marking period so the indicators aren't just a checkbox yes or no it's more of a qualitative Yes, so we're looking at assignments throughout the year and throughout mm -hmm. the trimester that match up to that checkbox. So okay. there might be multiple assignments where we're seeing them progress throughout the year. So we don't expect them to, you know, check off that box immediately. Some kids might, those mm -hmm. kids who, you know, come in a little bit more advanced. Um, but throughout that trimester, we're collecting different pieces of exemplar work um, that would show that the student is able to text or meet that um, standard. Got it. I just have two sort of questions <coughs> um, and one possibly for you. So okay. if we're talking about analyzing text and we're talking about the report card, how are they going to know on their daily work that they have an issue with analyzing text? So I mean you used to get if you didn't get it right, you didn't get a hundred, you got a ninety or whatever. So when they're doing their individual work, is there going to be a different way that you report on their daily work or their weekly work that lets them know? Yeah, so um, I think it's interesting because although it's a shift in our report card and the grading, it's really everything we've been doing already. You know, we give specific and um, immediate feedback to our students so that they know, you know, how can they improve on their work. So whether it be, you know, a draft in writing, we're not waiting like three weeks to then say, oh, you didn't do too well on this, mm -hmm. you know, 
we kind of pull them back the next day or in two days and we talk to them and meet with them that's when we confer with them in small groups or individually to talk about what are the areas that you can improve on we provide them with that support um, that you know targeted instruction and then that way we're expecting them to kind of grow throughout the trimester so I think that specific immediate feedback is essential to help them grow throughout the trimester um, so it's something we're already doing in the classroom so I think that's why the shift won't be you know too drastic of a change for us as teachers great yeah um, so and also I like to thank all of you guys I know how hard um, being a member of the curriculum committee how hard you've worked on this and made changes and adjusted with people's thoughts and so forth and it you know it was a real learning process for you and, and, and really getting out the best product and I do really appreciate that um, I guess my other question would be I know you've had a couple of presentations at the end of the year and realizing you know many people are <laughs> kind of on the downslope now <laughs> Um, so it come, when it comes out to the fall and the new year is starting, are you going to present like a time frame? Are we going to try and represent it at each elementary school, maybe at a PTSO meeting, so that when the parents are going into their conference time, they're a little bit prepared and so forth. Right. And I'd like to just get like a schedule so people can get it on their calendar because I'd like them to, you know, listen to you guys and really be prepared and, and work with you to, you know, get the best. Um, information for their child right so there are two things that we know for sure uh, and then there are more that we there's more that we would like to do mm -hmm. uh, two things we know for sure is back to school night we'll have some aspect of this uh, back to school night should be about more than just a report card so I, I but at the same time it will be once it's brought up you know it'll be of interest to people um, so but that is one one place where uh, it will be and it's a lot of parents will be there so that's a really good opportunity for us the other thing is that the conferences will still take place in a similar window that they have in the past at the elementary schools. So that's almost like a preview of what the report card might feel like. In other words, uh, uh, teachers will sit down with uh, the parents and, and look through some of the evidence together. And uh, that kind of discussion might help orient the parent to this new um, way of thinking when the report card does come a few weeks after that. Uh, so there's more that we can do, and um, we can even talk on Thursday at our SIP meeting about some other things that we might be able to do. Um, but th that's the start, but I know we can do more. I mean, we could have community meetings, um, uh, we could do more. Could you, you can say it too, as well as you're putting it on the curriculum website, could you put it on each elementary school website with a link to here? Yes. Because most people probably just go to their elementary school. Right. I was, yes, I was sort of hiding this for now until we <laughs> brought it to you. Right. And then Marianne said, when can I, she's going to push it out as well. But I felt like, you know, this was our kickoff. Yes. Well, in addition to the indicators, will there be the ability for the teacher to write the custom comments like they have in the past? Yes. Um, we, uh, we, so Genesis is our student information management system. And uh, they had a third party guy who was really a lot of fun. <laughs> Uh, who, who designs the report card and he lives out in California and uh, you know weird emails from him about you know I'll get to it tomorrow because I'm fishing and there are bald eagles coming down and they're fishing and they uh, like what percent of the time that they actually score a fish it was weird so you know he's from California what do you want but um, <laughs> he's, he, he was the principal he did a fantastic job and uh, so we uh, we have them in place now. They're, the templates are in place, and we've gone over them a gazillion times, as you can imagine. So, um, yeah, I think we're ready to go. But I don't know if I hit the essence of your question. How would it, I guess I mean, you, did, you did, but just as far as like from the I heard the grading. They're following up on Peggy's comment about the grading. But when a student gets like, for example, take the math test in fourth or fifth grade, what type of grade would they actually receive when they're taking a mm -hmm. math test? Are they getting an right. E or an A, or are they getting a numerical value? Just trying to understand well, what type of feedback they would be receiving when they're. <laughs> I know it. Right? Very good question. Uh, we've gotten this at all of our meetings, and we've started to prepare for that. In the past, there are typically like these chapter tests or unit tests in everyday math in elementary mm -hmm. school. So you may or may not be familiar that they come home fairly routinely. They're pretty good sized chapter tests or unit tests, we call them. And in the past, we just like assigned numbers to each, you know, like this one's gonna be worth four points, this one's gonna be worth two points, this one we think is a little bit more important, it's eight points. And now what we've done is we've taken a look, and we've worked in teams on this, so this has been a pretty big project for us. 
we would say, okay, on this Unit 3 test, actually there's four of the standards that are on our report card that are from the New Jersey Student Learning Standards. So we've created like a cover sheet for it that will say, here are the four standards that are on the report card that were on this test. And even with more detail, here's the first standard and these are the three questions that actually address that standard. And we're gonna let you and your child know like how they did yeah. on that standard. So it's really more of an itemized feedback on every question and what it relates to on the report card. So we have these cover sheets they're detailed with the exact same standards that are on the report card, and then it lists uh, the questions on the test and how the child would do. So it's actually a tremendous amount more information that you're gonna be getting um, on each unit test. And that's not something a teacher could really do on their own, like we've had to bring people together to work on that. So those I think are almost done in every grade for every unit test. Now teachers will also be making those in smaller assignments, like that inference one that you mentioned, like, oh, this was a good opportunity for an inference. What I might do is just simply send that home and say, this is our standard for inferencing that's on the report card, and if, you know, your child did a really nice job on it, that's an achieves the benchmark. Or, you know, I'm still looking for a little bit more depth here. They're progressing towards it, and you know, I'm just keeping you posted. Whereas before, if I wanted to send that home, I've actually been in the position as a teacher where I was like, I want to send this home, but like, what am I going to put on here? I would be like, what out of 100 would this be, right? And because you, you sort of had to create like the old system to give you that information. Sometimes people did it with like check, check plus, check minus to give you a sense like, yeah, they're doing it. Yeah, there's a little bit of work, but this is a little bit more of a sophisticated system to give you that ongoing feedback. So it will start to look a little different. We really hope that it will be more informative for you throughout the course of the trimester. Quick question. Sure. Um, so one of the, the goals for this, right, is to is to personalize the learning environment for each student. So I, I think that's a terrific goal. But to operationalize that, if you will, it seems like it's going to be a lot of work for you teachers, right? Because it's almost like you, you could end up how many you could have twenty kids in a class, and you've got to come up with a personalized instruction. I mean, some kids are gonna have the same learning objectives, yeah. but others will have different ones because they could be at a higher or lower level. Yeah. So that's gonna create a lot more work. I'm just kind of, this is just an observation I have. It's gonna create a lot more work, a lot, I'm, I would imagine that this is gonna create a lot more overtime for you all. Uh, are you prepared for that? Yeah, yes, I think it's already what we're doing, to yeah, be yeah, honest. Yeah, um, yeah. Our, I'm sure you are. Our uh, this, curriculum. This is a lot more though. But our curriculum mm -hmm. right now already lends itself to um, personalized instruction. Mm -hmm. So Readers and Writers Workshop is very much um, targeted small group instruction or individualized instruction. So every day you're conferencing and meeting with um, different students, groups of students who have the same objectives mm -hmm. um, to help them grow in those specific areas that they need um, support in. So it's really not anything that's brand new to us. And a lot of that individualized instruction really is happening. Um, in math, you know, everyday math allows us to give them um, enrichment activities. It also provides um, preparation activities. And those are resources that teachers are already using. You know, they know those students who struggle a little bit more um, in certain math areas, and they'll, you know, pull them aside in small groups when students are in independent work. So um, it's already being done. It's really now just becoming more transparent for the parents so they can see what's really going on and what learning is happening. Mm -hmm. I, just, uh, I can add a little bit more perspective overall with regard to the fact that, uh, so Readers and Writers Workshop, that rubric or the language arts rubric, that's like 10 pages long. As you can imagine, so much of what we do in elementary school does revolve around ELA and math. Um, so some of the other rubrics are just not that comprehensive. Um, also, those rubrics, particularly from ELA, came from maps that were already being completed. Uh, so maps are a little bit like what, what the trimesters are supposed to look like, what units are supposed to look like, and when different things are being done. Um, and the teachers were already trained uh, and adept at and received ongoing articulation time for it, what it means to see certain things when students are reading in a group, when students might be doing one-on-one -on -one work with a teacher. So that stuff is there. So it wasn't even so much that here's the rubrics, now you have to find it. It was more like here are the maps, how do these align with 
the report cards, and that's where the rubrics came from. But I mean, you're right. It, it's it's a lot of work, and uh, it it just sort of illustrates how much that they do do. Right. And uh, and then on top of that, there's still social studies and science and, and the specials. And uh, I mean, I have I think it's a great thing. I, I I have friends who have their children in private schools, and this is the level of transparency and detail they expect from the faculty in private schools. You don't. You wouldn't expect this in a public school system, so I think it's a it's a really good thing that you're providing this level of feedback to the parents and providing each student with personalized learning objectives like this. I think it's a, it'll really improve the, the learning environment yeah. for, for these kids. And if I could just make a comment too, one of the things that <coughs> you're sitting on the curriculum committee, you're, we are really fortunate that we get to see the teachers and the administrators on a monthly basis, and they come in and they talk to us about the you know, the business, the practice of teaching, and we get impressed every month by hearing mm -hmm. these, you know, these fine professional people tell us about this. And so seeing how, seeing all the work that's gone into this and seeing how transparent it will be for parents to see, oh, this is, this is how I will figure out how my child is doing, um, seeing how this will help ensure um, kind of a more standardized product, if you will, a more standardized approach across different schools, within different classrooms, or even within the same school at the same grade mm -hmm. level. Um, I think it's going to show exactly, you know, what some of us have been seeing for quite a while. That, you know, we've got a really great group of, of people working for us. So. I agree. Thanks for saying that. Yeah. Paul, correct me if I'm wrong, and Amy just sort of touched on it right there, uh, but this seems like we're moving towards a much more coordinated implementation of the curriculum across, across grade levels, district-wide. Well, yeah. So, I mean, in terms of you know, unit tests being having the same grading rubric and that. Yes, I mean, there's no way around it. As mm -hmm. far as like, we we were doing that as part of the readers and writers workshop. It's and it's not fully prescriptive where mm -hmm. everybody's doing exactly what you know lockstep kind of thing. But when teachers get together and say, "How are we going to know what that looks like?" You're right. They're going to come up with mm -hmm. similar act, this activity. Am I saying that right? So this activity will give us the evidence that that's happening. So it will it will improve, um, not that it wasn't already good, but it will improve mm -hmm. or assure the cons consistency across, you know, because this is the same story in, in all the different schools. Yeah, uh, family with a th third grader moves across town mm -hmm. halfway through the year, they should be able to pick up. It's the same quickly. language, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Are you gonna put a blank report card on the website too, just so people can see what the new report cards are gonna look like? Yeah, I, I, get, I don't think it does show up fully like that. So right. yes, I'm also going to, I think, come up with like a separate link that talks about the SEL aspects of the learning behaviors because that like sort of felt, I didn't mean for it to fall out. Yeah. Um, but I think it's another cool thing that we should highlight in it that really didn't get its, um, you know, its full sh you know, share here. And then I assume new teachers, when they get hired over the summer, are gonna have some orientation on this as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have one more question. Yes. For need support, the last part says it requires constant teacher support, mm -hmm. which seems like it would become very labor intensive if that's really the case. Is there a difference yeah. in how we're handling students that would start getting ends in a specific area, mm -hmm. or are we going to continue to do what we've been doing? And can you talk a little bit about what that is? Is it, is it case by case, or is there actually a protocol? we follow when a kid is identified as needing extra, extra support like that? So that's, that's, a, that's one of those questions where uh, we all talked a lot about one word, and so we did. I mean, there were different words that were in there at different times. Con mm -hmm. It needs continual support. Um, and then there was even the concept of, um, see, it comes from the concept of a teacher, of a student being able to work independently, and that demonstrates sort of exceeding when, you know, a standard versus not being able to work independently at all. Right. So the other way of saying that would be continual or constant support. Constant does sound a bit, um, I don't know, dramatic, but it, it is meant to reflect that they, they need a lot of support and, and therefore they have a lot of work to do, I guess. Um, so it is case by case. There could be a number of different reasons for that. So that sounds a little bit like a cop out, but there are a number of different ways it might, you might have, it might be a student was, out and it's a new skill so you know but it, it would I think this the most accurate way to say it is yeah case by case okay. and that would be a good discussion for a parent and a teacher to have what that means right. okay. Great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. if you could indulge I just want to give you a quick an analogy in case people ask you I know how people come up to board members you know you're picking up your avocado and your tomatoes and <laughs> so uh, 
And uh, it will be, I don't understand, A, B, C, D, because that's what I would be saying. And uh, you know, so I think this analogy works, and you can either affirm it or not. Maybe I shouldn't roll it out here in public. But no, so I like, so if you like softball or baseball, let's just pick fielding. So if you're a gold glove level fielder, that means you make outstanding plays on an ongoing, consistent basis all the time, let's say. And therefore, you are uh, superior among your peers and you're a gold glove, you know, gold glove player, uh, designated kind of player. Well, if you happen to make an error here or there during the season, that doesn't mean you're not a gold glove mm -hmm. player if you continually show that you were above and beyond mm -hmm. and made these like heroic catches and all that kind of fielding stuff. Um, if you were really strong and had those kinds of bumps in the road a little bit more consistently, you know, then maybe it's not so much exceeds as an E and it starts to become more like, uh, you know, achieves the standard. But I think that gives a good sense of it. The teachers aren't necessarily looking at one play. Wow, you messed that play up. You're, a, you know, you have an N uh, or uh, something to that effect. It's more like they look at a body of work and you know it when you see it kind of thing, which sounds subjective, but if you have a body of work and pieces of evidence, like in, my, in the analogy, you would just say, well, how, how many outstanding plays and, and maybe how many errors over the course of time? And, and that I think, is, is that okay? Yep. Can I use that again? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, feel free to, you know, I, I, I was looking for an analogy that might work. And I, I, do, did you want to, because you're here, but did you want to talk about the two um, school psychologists that Oh, sure. <laughs> that was sure. the best. Will, yeah. um, Paul and I did a presentation at Wilson and at Franklin. And the first one was at Franklin. And some parents were talking about this achieves versus exceeds. And they were sort of struggling with that as being a little bit different. And when we were at Franklin, there was a mom who is also a counselor in town and was talking about how sort of grade stress and anxiety is something that she really works with kids on. And she's like, this, the way you've set it up, is excellent for those kids. And we were like, great. You know, because <laughs> well, that's what we want it to be. We want it to be excellent. Go a little bit across town. We go to Wilson. We're having the exact same conversation. Mom raises her hand. She's a counselor in town as well, working with this exact same problem. And she goes, this is excellent for kids. And we were like, oh my goodness, we're two for two. We like to parade them around, but they won't do that because they have other things to do. But it made us feel good that people who work with kids, you know, like this is a pretty high achieving place. And we, we think that's excellent, but we also want to sort of guard against the downside. And we think that this promotes growth, but also keeps it in perspective. And we've gotten at least a little bit of validation from some local people who work on that topic. So that was just sort of something that we didn't expect, mm -hmm. but we're pleased to see. So just another, I'm sorry, another question. So is the long-term vision then eventually to roll this something similar out to the middle schools and the high school, or just keep it at the elementary schools? So, um, yeah, that's, I, I personally don't have an agenda at all with regard to, like I don't have an opinion about the grades there, uh, going six, changing the grade structure from grade six through eight. And I think like, I, I don't wanna leave the impression that this is so, uh, great that it needs to be everywhere because it's a developmental thing as well. Okay. So um, I, we're, I know one thing that Dr. Bolton and, well I know a few things, that Dr. <laughs> Bolton and Mrs. Fendis are really strong at understanding what kids need to learn and grow and, and what it means to teach the whole child. So they actually saw a piece of this presentation and I saw them kind of go off together and start chatting. So that was a cool thing and they're excited about this philosophy. And they've been working on, on social emotional learning already. And so they see connections between this philosophy and social emotional learning. So I don't want to speak for them. And I trust them, you know, a, a great deal to come forward. And if they were to say that we should consider it. But I don't think that's the focus for them. I think the focus is carrying this philosophy over and what they can do to reinforce it um, okay. at the six through eight level. I guess because I have my PTO meetings coming up soon. Mm -hmm. and it, there's some fifth grade moms on the board. They may ask me, so I just want to be, mm -hmm. didn't want to put you on the spot. Yeah. No. Thank you. Thanks a lot. All right. Thanks. Thank Great you. presentation. Great. Thank you. Thank you. We really do appreciate all that you put in. Thank you. A little more robust. That's right.
Well, I think it was uh, pretty apparent in the presentation how much work and thought has gone into it, how uh, we listened to teachers' voices and uh, made adjustments, um, and how we're now we're listening to parents' voices as meetings are being held. Um, so we're really looking forward to it. And, and it actually is a great segue into the second superintendent's report. Second superintendent's report um, is a report on the work we've done this year on three goals. And the first goal focuses on our efforts to try to work for uh, <coughs> consistency district-wide on helping our students develop their social and emotional skills. Um, and as you've heard, the new standards-based report card really does help with that. It helps with uh, self-awareness. Students from a young age will know where they may have strengths and where they might have weaknesses. It helps them also with self-management. So if you do have a weakness, what do you do about that, right? And it also helps them with, um, uh, with uh, responsible decision-making. You know, if I know this is an area of weakness, a relative area of weakness, what am I going to do about that? Am I going to designate some time to work on that when I'm home? Um, I'm going to ask my teacher. So it, in all of those areas, it really helps with social and emotional learning competencies. It really supports that. And again, as you've heard, it is, and has, as was pointed out by a question, it is across all of our elementary schools. So that's certainly one way that we've really been working um, to make sure that we are developing social and emotional skills. Um, in general, what we also did was work with our teachers first, our administrators first actually, we started training last summer, and then with our teachers about the importance of how we use language. And how we use language in instruction really can support, or not, but can support social and emotional learning. And as some of you noted when we had a board meeting, for example, in Tamaquas to, um, I'm sorry, in Jefferson, to, um, to honor our PhilHire Award winner, we saw a growth mindset on the bulletin boards in that school. And as you walk through the various schools, you will see similar things, sometimes in classrooms, sometimes in hallways, trying to make sure people are paying attention to what language do we use to support students um, as, they, um, as they determine who they are and what they can do to achieve goals. So we've done a lot of work in that, focusing on language, and not just on bulletin boards and the like, but as some of the um, curriculum have been revised this year, there's been a real focus on are we addressing social and emotional learning in our lessons. So for example, the English language arts curriculum for grades six through eight, how are we addressing this in this very critical age level? How are we helping to promote social and emotional um, learning? I think you also saw a little bit of that with the, the musicians who were here earlier who we honored, and also with the music teachers. There's a place where you really do have to identify what, what is your area of weakness, and then you have to figure out how to work on that to achieve a goal, and you don't always make your goal, but you practice making your goal. And also, I thought you saw in the chorus, um, how they work together, right? Their relationship skills. They weren't just focused on themselves, they were watching what was going on around them, and that's part of social and emotional learning as well, not just focusing on yourself. Looking around, seeing where there are needs, um, and seeing how you can help out, for example. So I, I thought we saw a lot of our efforts for social and emotional learning, um, just even tonight. Uh, one of the things we really appreciated about this was once we started working on this and talking about it at PTO meetings and PTC meetings and board meetings, parents reached out to us and said, we'd like to use the same language. We'd like to be able to promote social and emotional learning um, in our homes as well. So it was parents who came to us and asked us not only for resources on our website, which we have provided, um, some of the board presentation we had in November about social and emotional learning, that's on the website so people can view. Not everyone can come to a board meeting, but they can see just that part of the board meeting if they're interested. And it was parents at the high school who said, we think this is important, and they were the ones who suggested we do TED Talks. So although administrators in this district are not trained in doing uh, live uh, talks, um, we, we, we stretched ourselves and we did do uh, TED Talks which were um, sent out to all parents and which are on the website. So if somebody does have something they want to work on with their child, there are some suggestions and there's an explanation also as to what each of the competencies in social emotional learning are. And one last thing about social emotional learning. Um, earlier this year in the, in the winter, um, we had a representative come from the New Jersey Department of Education 
and his area of focus is on social and emotional learning. And he came to see what we were doing in the high school. So he looked at our transition program. Our transition program are some students who are junior, juniors and seniors who volunteer and are chosen to meet with incoming freshmen through the course of the freshman year to try to help those students transi transition into the high school. It's a large high school and we want to make sure people um, have a strong support system. And that definitely helps the students with the high school issues related to social and emotional learning. So the, de the Department of Education individual um, saw our transi transition program and working and was very impressed by it. He also spoke with a few of our supervisors. He spoke with the supervisor of English Language Arts, also our um, coordinator for our physical education program, another place where it's very easy to incorporate social and emotional learning. He also met with our director of guidance. Our counselors, we count on them. They truly are the experts in this field, um, so they are very important in the work that they do, starting from kindergarten all the way up through 12th grade. And uh, the uh, representative from the Department of Education was very pleased with what he saw, and he actually has asked us going forward if we could perhaps help some other districts and give our ideas so they can determine how to incorporate it in, in their districts. So we, we really are pleased with that, and I never want anyone to think we have finished and we have conquered social-emotional learning. <laughs> it's not just students who are learning that. We all are. We're all trying to, to continue and to grow and um, so we will continue on, on those fronts as well. Our second goal, we actually demonstrated a bit today as well, and that was, okay, we have the new website. How are we going to make sure that we monitor it and that it stays consistent? We had heard, we'd reached out a great deal to parents and say, okay, what do you want in the new website? Um, one of the main things we heard is, I have kids in three levels and every school page is different and I never know where to find anything. And the search button doesn't work. <laughs> That's what we heard in the old website. So a few things. We also asked them what was most important. What do you really need to be able to reach quickly? So based on that, on the top of the, uh, each of the pages, you can, on the top right, you can immediately reach the parent portal. You can go to student registration and you can go to the calendar as well. And this is very important, the search button does work. So when you are frustrated <laughs> and you don't know what column or what button to pull down, please go to the search and, and it really will help you get there. I tested as, free, as recently as this afternoon. So you, you can find things. Uh, the other thing we did so that uh, parents could be less frustrated, the buttons that go across, they're the same buttons, mm -hmm. okay? So uh, there is home, there is school information, departments, family resources, staff resources, and schools. Um, if you go to schools, if you're on any page, you can get to whatever school you want to go to quickly, or if you're on a school, you can get to the district. It's very easy. Now, underneath each of those drop-downs, across all elementary schools, the drop-down lists are the same. But you could see a difference between the elementary drop downs and the intermediate mm -hmm. and between the intermediates and the high school because there are just different mm -hmm. topics they have to focus on. <coughs> right. uh, but honestly, if I were to say what have I heard that parents like the most or community members like the most about the website, I would have to say it is the pictures. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and truly, it's not just that the pictures are great, they are. You know, there, there are a lot of wonderful pictures that, that change. But it is true that a picture tells a thousand words, right? And um, so you learn a lot about the district. Often parents know about the world of their child, but they don't know about the world of the other children. But these pictures allow more stories to be told and allow parents to ask questions about, I didn't know about that program. And so that's been very helpful. And another really important part of this is uh, we want the, this website to be accessible to all. You know, whether somebody has a vision problem or needs assistance in some other way. So we've worked really hard for accessibility and continue to do so. And the other very important message I want to get out here tonight is, and we know it's not perfect, so as someone sees something or has a suggestion or sees another district that did something well, please, please let us know. We, we do monitor it and we do um, make changes when, uh, when we see a need for it. Um, so I think the website is, is working well at this point. And our third goal, 
Our third goal was to build an alumni database. Um, we have for years tried to figure out how to do alumni engagement and outreach. We've tried a number of things, and truthfully, we haven't really been successful. But this year, we have made progress. <laughs> um, so on the website, if you go under district information, the second, uh, the second item there is alumni registry or directory. And um, anyone who's gone to West, Westfield High School um, can go on there and submit their information. There's not a lot of information. We're not giving the information to anyone. It's basically their email. They tell us their name and, their, uh, and the year they graduated. That's verified to make sure they really did go to Westfield High School because we don't want someone who's really there to get other emails. Um, so uh, we verify that everybody was a Westfield High School graduate. In the beginning when we did this, beginning of the year, I will tell you that those registrations were coming in really slowly, <laughs> very slowly. But then out came the first um, edition of the Blue Devil Bulletin. And the Blue Devil Bulletin, um, you can only receive the copy of it if you are on the registry. And um, it has information and stories, entertaining stories, about graduates from Westfield High School from various decades. It has pictures from yearbooks gone by. It has stories, uh, the one you see here, Matt Scalar. If anyone saw the Broadway show The Prom, he's the composer of it. He's also been the composer of, of other Broadway shows. So little vignettes telling us about various people in various areas. There was a scientist. Um, there were a number of people who have been highlighted. Um, and again, pictures. Um, so that we got a lot more hits after the first edition of the Blue Devil Bulletin. And we had a second edition of the Blue Devil Bulletin, and again, we have more hits. I'm sure my number is dated at this point, but recently uh, we had hit 775 alumni, which, uh, which was a, a lot of good growth. There's information there when classes are having reunions. They've now given us that information. We've added it. Um, our English department was looking at uh, the senior project to see if they wanted to change it, um, and they, they actually surveyed graduates about their experiences to find out their point of view. And going forward, one of the next things we want to do is um, see if we can get, so we know we have some graduates who are looking either for internships or they're looking for job opportunities. Well, we also have graduates who are in a position where they may have internships or, mm. or job openings. So one of our next areas we want to move into is to try to figure out how to, how to uh, mesh those two groups. So we actually are, are quite pleased with that and think we have started to make inroads and plan to do more. And any graduate you know, please tell them to sign up. We're looking to continue to grow our ranks. So they're being encouraged, the seniors are being encouraged to join before they graduate? Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> yes, they are. <laughs> yes, they are. And that will help build it as well. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Dolan. Um, and thank you, Paul, and, and your team. Um, I can't thank you enough for all the work that you've done. Um, I didn't run into somebody in the avocado tomato aisle, mm. but <laughs> while out walking my dog, um, one of my neighbors stopped and talked about your presentation at Wilson. Um, and she was very positive. She gave a, a couple pieces of feedback. So I'm always happy to know that people are listening. That's a big step in this, in this process, and I think it'll be a year of growing and learning and um, great information for our students and for our parents, so I'm excited. And Dr. Dolan, in reference to our district goals, um, for the four years I've been on the board, I think this was, I, I'm just gonna say personally, the one year that I really see a lot of, not that we didn't mm -hmm. reach our goals beforehand, but I feel so much better this year that we've gone above and beyond in, in reference to our district goals. And it's you know a testament to everybody who works here and so forth and working with our schools and our students and so forth. And, and I thank you. And I know Marianne, I can't you know, not call out to her uh, in reference to the alumni network and so forth. Great, great work. I mean, it's, you know, you took us from nothing. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know how many years ago we really began discussing this, two or three, mm -hmm. to where we are today is, is amazing. And I hope it continues to grow because um, Westfield's a great place, the school system's a great place, and you know, people do want to look back and see you mm -hmm. know, what people are doing with who they went to school with. So, um, I thank you very much. Thank you. Anybody else have any questions in reference to the reports tonight? Mm -hmm. No? no um, I agree, though. Uh, I'd like the board to approve the minutes of the board meeting held on May 7th, 2019, and the private minutes of May 7th, 2019. Do you have a second? Michael? All in favor? Yes. Aye. 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 
Any opposed abstentions? No? Okay, we'll move on. Personnel, Amy. Uh, yes, I would like the board to um, consider items 1 through 23. Can I have Second. A Thank you, Kent. Um, I think we do not have any 50-year uh, <laughs> retirees this year, but are, are there any other uh, any items to call out? <laughs> Retirement of staff. Oh, yeah. Uh, there are, uh, there two are two long-term long substitutes ah. who are retiring this evening, okay. and substitutes, uh, we certainly count on them, there's no doubt. Um, they don't know where they're going to be on any given day, what age the students are sometimes, and uh, we certainly count on them and appreciate their work. Um, Mike Beelan? Yes. Kent Diamond? Yes. Brendan Galligan? Yes. Brian Marcy? Yes. Tara Porto? Yes. Peggy Oster? Yes. Amy Ruth? Yes. Thank you, Amy. Mm -hmm. um, facilities, as Gretchen is not here, um, I originally am, had, we had a meeting this Friday on our calendar, but due to the fact that there's no school, our next meeting is in June, the end of June. at the end of June. Uh, Dana, do you have any reports on the projects? How so is the field going with all the all the, of rain? the projects are started? Um, not they're not all physically in the buildings right now because obviously school is in session. Mm -hmm. um, but everything has been is underway. We've met with all the contractors, so we've got at least one or two job meetings into it, and materials are being ordered, and uh, their construction schedules are being planned. So for the projects that we couldn't start ahead of time. As soon as school ends, we'll be in there working in every building pretty much. Right. It's going to be a very, very busy summer. Great. Thank you very much. Has this schedule with the field been affected at all by the last two months of rain? The, it has not. We are still ahead of schedule. Um, early June, field turf will be on site to start installing the actual turf. Um, so, no, these contractors have been amazing. They have removed the water as soon as it rain was done they removed the water and continued working so they have really been doing a great job fantastic yeah how's the uh, track team coping with their situation they, they, they really i could answer that one <laughs> 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 I, they've actually been doing okay they go over i know off the scotch plains fanwood who has been, they've been doing uh, various meets there and they've had a number of outside meets so they're getting through it and they are being resilient they're being <laughs> resilient yeah they are truly <laughs> They do want it back, though. Yes, <laughs> understood. It's going to be great. Mm -hmm. They're looking forward to it, that's I'm for sure. sure. Um, Long-range planning, Amy? Um, we have not had a long-range planning meeting since uh, our board meeting, two board meetings ago, but we've been having kind of independent conversations around uh, long-range planning topics. So um, we're looking forward to, I think, uh, we're looking at perhaps doing a workshop in after one of our meetings in June to discuss things a little more robustly to talk about the issues that that we did address a little bit um, when at two meetings ago when we were here in this location when we had some members of the public ask questions about full-day kindergarten present some ideas um, we've been having conversations with some um, town council people about their ideas um, we had a, a great meeting today with some of our, um, our uh, state politicians at Senator Kane's office that was really interesting and helpful and um, we're anxious to hear what they may be able to tell us about potential changes or uh, um, maybe just some other avenues to explore so it's it's you know conversations continue so I'll leave it at that for now okay okay policies Brendan uh, no report for tonight actually wow I don't remember the last time that happened but we do have a committee meeting coming up Next Tuesday. Next Tuesday. Okay, great. I'm back to you again, Amy. Uh, Why curriculum. Yes. Why yes. Uh, I would like uh, the board to consider items one and two. Second. Thank you, Kent. Um, it's pretty straightforward. We have not had a meeting to discuss curriculum issues since our last uh, meeting. We do have our next meeting on Thursday morning, so we'll have some more um, curriculum items to review. We have two district field trips under item one and an additional student teacher for next year. So if anybody has any questions. What does ABA stand for? Um, Advanced uh, Behavioral Analysis. It's, it's a system that's used with students who um, are on the autism spectrum. Okay. And it's a very defined uh, process to give them repetition and also um, feedback. Okay. And 
and only those students are going on the trip? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a self-contained classroom. Uh -huh. Yep. Okay. Uh, yep, let's vote. Mike Beeland? Yes. Kent Diamond? Yes. Brendan Galligan? Yes. Brian Morrissey? Yes. Brett, oh, I'm sorry, Tara Porto? Yes. Peggy Astor? Yes. Amy Root? Yes. Okay, moving on to finance. I'd like the board to consider items 1 through 20. Do I have a second? Second. Kent? Um, at this time, I'd like to call out a couple of gifts that were given to the district. Um, number 12, we're accepting a gift of $10,000 from the Westfield Education Fund to upgrade a, an Edison Intermediate School classroom to create an innovative classroom. Also number 13, accept another gift of $10,000 from the Westfield Education Fund to upgrade a, a Roosevelt Intermediate School classroom to create an innovative uh, classroom. These are both going into our technology classrooms at both of the intermediate schools. Um, number 14 is to accept a gift of $1,000 from the Westfield Education Fund to Project 79 in honor of Dr. Derek Nelson. Um, also, uh, we have a couple of grants. Um, accept a grant from the Union County Board of Chosen Freeholders and the <laughs> Open Space Recreation and Historic Preservation Trust Fund to McKinley School in the amount of $250 towards gardening equipment and materials through the Kids Dig In grant program. Also, uh, another grant from the Union County Board of Chosen Freeholders and the Open Space Recreation and Historic Preservation Trust Fund to Tamaqua School in the amount of $250 toward their gardening equipment and materials through Kids Dig In grant program. Tamaqua also received $100 from Rake and Ho towards gardening supplies, lessons, and tastings. Uh, their tastings <laughs> are good. Yeah. They grow very good uh, mm -hmm. lettuce, et cetera. Oh, and mm -hmm. then they make like a... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there you go. It's yeah, very good. It's good. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and also, one other grant from the Union County Board of Chosen Freeholders and the Open Space Recreation and Historic Preservation Trust Fund to Jefferson School for gardening materials to raise bed gardens, soil, and labor valued at approximately $250 through the Kids Dig In grant program. We do thank our freeholders for these grants and supporting our schools. Um, and lastly, I'd like to accept a gift of $56,878.38 from the Franklin School PTO for the purchase and installation of additional equipment for the Franklin School Playground. Thank you very much, Frank Franklin School PTO. And as I always say, we appreciate everybody who helps us in our education process and gives us a little bit extra to give back to our kids. So thank you. Any questions? Did the uh, the ten thousand dollar gift for the innovative classroom is that cover the full cost to the classroom, or the district has to pay some as well? It it does not cover a full cost, and we actually the the two classrooms, one in each uh, mm -hmm. school, actually have different needs. So okay. we're um, we're going to be working on that and see what it is we can do to make the best use of that money. But you're right; it won't completely renovate those two rooms. Okay. Any other questions, Dana? Mike Beeland. Yes. Ken Diamond? Yes. Brendan Gareth Galligan? Yes. Brian Morrissey? Yes. Tara Porto? Yes. Peggy Astor? Yes. Amy Root? Yes. Okay. Michael, do you have anything on technology? Uh, we haven't had a meeting yet, but we'll have one planned for June 7th uh, to review the uh, board social media policy and any changes that we have because it's been updated in a number of years and things have changed in a couple of years. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit. Okay. Uh, great. I'd like the board to consider the notes for the record. Okay. Um, do we have any unfinished business? No. Nope. Any new business? Yes. Brendan. Uh, so I alluded to it at our two board meetings ago, mm -hmm. but I've been in the process of trying to award Derek or recommend Derek Nelson be posthumously awarded uh, a medal through the Department of Defense. And I, I emailed out tonight uh, a copy of or the first draft of that resolution. And it's long, there's a lot of background that I don't need to read, but I do want to read what I'm nominating him for. Okay, that would be great. Uh, so the, the award is called the Soldier's Medal. Uh, it was established by an act of Congress in July 1926. Uh, the Soldier's Medal is awarded to any person of the armed forces of the United States who while serving in any capacity with the Army of the United States, including members of the Army Reserves not serving in active duty at the time of the heroic act, 
distinguished himself or herself by heroism not involving conflict with the enemy. Uh, the extraordinary act must have resulted in an accomplishment so exceptional and outstanding as to clearly set the individual apart from his or her comrades or from other persons in similar circumstances, and the heroism must have involved clearly recognizable personal hazard or danger and the voluntary risk of life under conditions not involving conflict with the enemy. Uh, it's the highest, uh, highest recognition that the Department of Defense will give to soldiers serving in a civilian capacity. And I believe, I believe he's, uh, Dr. Nelson's sacrifice to try and donate bone marrow to save a life qualifies under that. Uh, so uh, next week we'll, I'll, we'll formally vote on the resolution. I just wanted everybody to have a little introduction to it. But the resolution will be sent directly to the Secretary of the Army with a copy being sent to the, uh, the Secretary of Defense. That would be for, uh, amazing. Yeah. So there is no, there's no deadline or anything. These are no. continuously given out. Absolutely. Okay. How long will it take them to decide, do you think? It's political. <laughs> 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 I mean, right now there's three or four people on the list of copies that we're going to be sending this to yeah. with acting titles that are going to be playing musical chairs with each other. So they're all getting copies in case they move around okay. <laughs> so that things don't get lost in the shuffle. This is great. Thanks for doing it. Yeah, yeah thanks. Yeah, thank, you. thank you for researching it and mm -hmm. uh, you know bringing it to our attention and yeah. and going forward with it. Mm -hmm. it's, it's an honor that I think you truly deserve. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Um, do we have any liaison reports to make? I meet with the library board on Thursday. <laughs> no, we're here on a book sale one. That's big, you know, friends of the library. Mm -hmm. I've met a few times um, since I last reported with the uh, Franklin PTO, and they have indeed been very diligent uh, in reviewing different designs for the playground. So I know they're excited um, to move forward, and, uh, and the, it'll <coughs> certainly be very exciting for the kids. So kudos to them for all their hard work to raise the funds and to uh, you know, utilize them as thoughtfully as they're, they're doing. So that's okay. been good. Mm -hmm. I'd like to just mention that Lincoln is having their book fair from May 29th until the 31st. Um, also, so now I'd like to recognize the public for any questions or comments. Seeing nobody come <laughs> forth to the podium, um, I would like the board to approve the following resolution. Resolved that the Board of Education move into private session for the purpose of discussing matters rendered confidential by state and federal law, contract negotiations, the superintendent's evaluation, reviewed board self-evaluation, and be it further resolved that any discussions held by the board which need not remain confidential and the results of the discussion will be made public as soon as practical. Do I have a second? Second. Kent? All in favor? Aye. 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 We're adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.